Welcome to Entrepreneurship 201, Financial Strategy and Access to Capital for Black Entrepreneurs. My name is Chi Ilian Dule. I'm a corporate commercial lawyer at Calgary Office of Blakes. And I'm very glad to have you all here. I'd just like to say thank you on behalf of BNI Alberta for joining us here today. And it's exciting to note that we have over 200 people signed up for today's conversation. But before we start, we have a few housekeeping points to cover. We'll be taking questions throughout the program, throughout this event. And if you can please put your questions through the Q&A button on your screen, that will be great. We may not have time to answer all of the questions we get, but the goal is to try to get to as many as we can. And just a quick disclaimer, because I'm a lawyer and we like disclaimers, is the views expressed at this event are those of the speakers and the panelists alone and not of their organizations. And so I'd like to introduce the chair of BNI Alberta chapter and the co-chair of BNI Mentorship and Sponsorship Committee, Dr. Chika Onwekwe to kick us off. Dr. Chika Onwekwe QC, he is, he is the vice president legal, general counsel and corporate secretary of Trican. He sits on the board of both NMAX Corporation and the Canadian Public Accountability Board. And he volunteers with the Law Society of Alberta, the Canadian Corporate Council Association and, various, and on various initiatives for black communities across Canada. So over to you, Dr. Chika. Thank you so much, E. Thank you so much again uh, for that uh, kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to BNI Entrepreneurship 201, Financial Strategy and Access to Capital for Black Entrepreneurs, organized by Black North Initiative, Alberta Chapter. As you are aware, Black North was established just barely two years ago to stamp out and eliminate anti-systemic racism and associated barriers in corporate Canada against Black Canadians using a business-first approach. Our mandate in Alberta, being part of BNI, is to work with stakeholders, both corporate and gov government, to advance the mandate of Black North Initiative in Alberta by removing all manner of barriers, discriminations, and anti-Black systemic racism in Alberta to enable Black Canadians rise to positions of leadership in their chosen career professional business. Hence, small business and entrepreneurship is one of our focus areas in Alberta here. As you, could as you can recall, last year, February 25th, 2021, we held the Entrepreneurship Readiness 101 workshop, which was meant to ignite the entrepreneurship spirit of Black Canadians. Following that workshop and the positive feedback received, as well as subsequent wide-ranging consultations, we are pleased to be having another important conversation today to assess with respect to access to capital as a vital resource that fuels successful business enterprises in Canada and globally. The urgent question remains how to open access to capital resource or resources to existing and up and coming black entrepreneurs in Canada. As you know, information is key. On that note, I am very delighted to introduce our keynote speaker for today's event, Mr. Joe Rosenzweig. Mr. J. Rosenzweig, who is an accomplished entrepreneur and one of the top movers and shakers on Bay Street in Toronto here. Jay is an internationally renowned social impact entrepreneur, humanitarian, trained lawyer, and leadership strategist. He is the founder of the Rosenzweig and Company, which is who, you know, that deals with building and attracting world-class teams. He consults to public and private companies, including large global corporations, emerging growth to mid-sized businesses, professional service firms, and so forth. Jay has been immense global, globally in human rights causes for over two decades. Most importantly, Jay only invests in areas that advance human causes. He is the chair of the board of Iwin Cutlass Royal Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and a board member of the Black North Initiative. In addition, he sits on a number of other purpose-driven boards supporting causes ranging from healthcare, youth empowerment, refugee protection. Jay invests in businesses whose mission is to foster a world that gives equal opportunities to all 
including greater access to education, capital and mobility. Jay's work has been featured in several publications, including the New York Times, Fast Company, The Guardian, BNN Bloomberg, Cheddar, Bull TV, Digital Trends, and so on, so, so on and so forth. He is an enigma and has you know, earned three degrees at McGill University in the area of philosophy, civil law, and common law. So guys, stay tight, hold, and let's listen to Jay. Jay, you're on. Thank you very much, uh, Chika. I appreciate the uh, flattering uh, introduction and uh, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, and, and I'm always so honored to be able to uh, uh, let people know that I'm on the board of Black, the Black North Initiative and, and to try and uh, affect positive change in the world through uh, this wonderful organization. I thought um, that it might be helpful to provide uh, a little bit about my background as context and tell some stories as to uh, how I uh, reached uh, the uh, position I'm in today and, and uh, how we can find, uh, you know, great ways uh, to access capital um, for the Black community and for those who've historically been disadvantaged. And uh, without further ado, um, I, I'll just jump in and let everybody know that um, uh, I'm a Montrealer uh, by background, born and raised in uh, in Montreal, and I credit my parents, uh, Meyer and Rose Rosenzweig, uh, for shaping really who I am today. We grew up in a neighborhood called Ville Saint Laurent, um, a predominantly um, uh, white a Jewish uh, a neighborhood. Uh, my dad was um, a, a terrific uh, entrepreneur. Um, he started his business, an electrical contracting business, at the age of, I think, about 20. Um, he had uh, previously been working uh, during the war, um, developing complex uh, uh, switchboards and circuit boards for, um, for, for uh, complex ships, uh, worked for a year uh, for a large electrical contracting business and then started his own. Um, my parents owned a uh, duplex. Uh, they had uh, tenants uh, upstairs and in, and in the basement apartment. Um, and uh, for better or for worse, um, <laughs> entrepreneurship was always uh, a topic of uh, discussion. Uh, so it, it was kind of in my blood, always a topic of discussion at the dinner table. There was nothing fancy or wasteful about the way my father uh, conducted his business. He, um, his office was carved out of a, a space in the basement, carved out of a, a chunk of the garage. Um, and, uh, and, and that's the way it was for us. Uh, my mother was, a uh, wonderful and welcoming um, woman. Uh, I remember one year when I was a young kid about to have a birthday, she decided to have a party for me and invite my friends from the block. And the group of kids that I used to play with included two black girls, uh, twins, um, Petra and Camille. And unfortunately, one of my friend's fathers hesitated on hearing that the twins were being invited. But my mother was not moved by this disapproval at all. She stuck to her guns and more than that, she found a way to make her point. In those days, it was common to take photos using a Polaroid Instagram, uh, uh, inst instant camera at parties. And uh, so she said to the man's son, come over here and uh, let me take a picture of you and plopped him between uh, Petra and Camille. And she later took the picture and dropped it in the man's mailbox. And she had made her point and really provided me with a lifetime uh, and a lifelong uh, lesson. Um, Eventually, I, I uh, uh, studied at um, McGill University, where I did a philosophy degree uh, and two law degrees. And, and in the law school, I met a very important mentor who uh, Chika had uh, referred to, Erwin Kotler, who's an international human rights uh, champion. He represented uh, people who uh, uh, were, were wrongfully convicted. Um, he's, he's very well known for having uh, represented uh, Nelson Mandela uh, back in the day and other political prisoners like Natan Sharansky. And I ended up loading up on a lot of his courses and working for him summers. And he ended up um, uh, becoming, as, as a lot of you might know, uh, Canada's Attorney General and Minister of Justice, where he enacted all kinds of progressive laws and freed more people who were wrongfully convicted in one year, more than any of the previous ministers combined, um, and enacted all kinds of other progressive laws like um, 
uh, I believe he might have been the first um, uh, individual, and we were the first country perhaps to have enacted same-sex marriage legislation. He was, uh, in the very least, a pioneer in that area. But if you fast forward to today, uh, as Chica had mentioned, I'm the chair of uh, his human rights organization, which is called the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. And we are representing political prisoners all around the world, the Nelson Mandela's, if you will, uh, of today. And sadly, there's a lot of them and we're protecting media freedoms and combating the global trend toward authoritarianism, um, women's rights, of course, and really combating racism and hate in all its forms, wherever it might manifest itself. So in my capacity as uh, chair of uh, the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and um, board uh, member of Black North, I've, I've done my best to try to um, bring the organizations together and will continue to do that in common cause. For example, we issued a joint statement uh, on the importance of um, a police reform. Um, I brought together the Jewish and black communities uh, in common cause against anti-Semitism and anti-black racism. And we had a follow on uh, event uh, where we brought in all, all kinds of communities from uh, the Muslim community to the indigenous community to the Asian community. And it's uh, an intersectionality I think is is a cause that, uh, that's super important to me. While I'm on the topic of um, uh, the category of nonprofit, I'll mention a couple of other nonprofits that I'm involved in. Um, one is uh, called uh, the Pandemic of Love, which was set up by my dear friend, Shelly Tagilski. Uh, as the pandemic was, was coming on, she foresaw an economic um, uh, potential crisis. And she's raised to date $60 million uh, for those in need during the pandemic. Uh, she was made a CNN hero this year. Uh, she now writes a column in Time about the beautiful relationships and learnings that have been developed between donors and donees. Uh, another one I'll mention is when we band together, um, helping to build uh, shelters and uh, educational centers and sports and wellness centers in Lesbos, Greece where they have uh, probably the largest refugee camp in the world. Uh, but to rewind, um, when I uh, graduated law school, I moved to Toronto where I still live and worked at a law firm that um, uh, probably most prominently represented uh, people who were wrongfully convicted, um, uh, cases like the Guy Paul Moran case and the Milgard case. Um, cases that uh, Professor Kotler was working on as Minister of Justice concurrently and we were able to be successful in a lot of our cases, largely because DNA technology was becoming more and more reliable. Um, but eventually I saw an opportunity in the business world. And uh, while it was a major pivot, I decided to take it uh, with a boutique firm in the talent strategy space um, and uh, help that business grow to the point where Corn Ferry, which is a firm uh, a number of you may be aware of, the largest firm in the world, uh, bought us um, and it was a wonderful experience for me, young guy. Suddenly, um, uh, I'm, I'm one of the youngest partners globally at the world's largest uh, talent strategy firm. And uh, life was good, leveraging off of the brand. Um, stayed on for a few years, but I'm really an entrepreneur by nature, as I described. Um, and I thought I could better serve my clients if I um, developed a boutique firm to compete with those big firms. And that's what I did. And I've been very fortunate, as Chica alluded to, um, we're, uh, we're now doing work really all around the world for some of the world's biggest companies, helping them to um, really design, build and attract world-class teams, helping private equity firms to change out their leadership to achieve their goals um, post-acquisition. And, um, and lastly, over the last 10 years or so, I've I've gotten very deeply involved um, in helping founders to scale up their businesses from many points of view, whether it be team building, um, fundraising, uh, business development, overall strategic and operational advice, just given all the um, uh, experience that I've been so fortunate to have been able to develop over the years. So it's gotten to the point now where I'm literally on the advisory board of dozens of uh, emerging growth businesses. We've had some nice exits. We're on the verge of some others. Um, of late, we've gotten very deeply involved in the uh, world of Web3, 
Uh, I'm in like 15 or 20 different projects in the world of Web3, um, which I'd be happy to uh, answer questions about if that's at all of interest to anyone in the audience um, with um, uh, partners and investors whose names you would, uh, you would recognize. And, and as Chika uh, alluded to, um, uh, the most important projects for me are really at the intersection of profit and purpose. And in that regard, uh, I'm invested in a number of businesses that help in, 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 that, in, in that space. Uh, Ozone X is uh, one based out of New York, uh, run by an incredible man named Jacques-Philippe Piverger. Uh, we are investing exclusive in, exclusively in businesses um, who are founded by and, and help those who have historically been disadvantaged. Um, another one out of New York is called Rebalance Capital, run by an amazing guy named Josh uh, Tannenbaum. Uh, it's a venture firm um, and we invest specifically in um, businesses, again, whose mission it is uh, to help those who've historically been uh, disadvantaged. Um, and uh, the kinds of businesses we're specifically investing in are ed tech, uh, fintech, and mobility tech. And happy to, uh, of course, elaborate on that. Um, here in Canada, I'm on the advisory board of Black Innovation Capital, uh, run by uh, Isaac Olawalafi, and, and, and really enjoy bringing deal flow uh, to, uh, to that venture, um, which is backed, as a number of you may know, by organizations like BDC and Royal Bank, and uh, that, that's been a wonderful and exciting ride. Um, another venture firm that I'm uh, invested in and advising is called Halogen Partners, run by uh, an incredible woman named Jessie Draper out of Los Angeles. Um, she's the fourth generation of a uh, very prominent venture capital um, family. Tim Draper is a very well-known, her dad, a very well-known uh, venture capitalist. Um, her grandfather actually uh, is known as the founder of venture capital, sort of like the godfather of venture capital. And Jesse's business invests exclusively in female-founded businesses, probably the leading uh, venture firm in the world, investing exclusively exclusively in, in female uh, founders um, with a focus on consumer uh, tech. Um, what I'd say is uh, the, the path has been uh, a really interesting and, and, and fascinating one for me. And, and one of the things that I've always found uh, got me to really interesting places is, is, is approaching life and the business world and the venture space with a lot of humility and approaching the universe with uh, a true sense of um, curiosity and 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 being, uh, if you will, a, a student uh, a student for life. You know, having a sense and joy, a sense of joy really in um, in the process and in in in, uh, in observing the world as being infinitely uh, possible if you embrace it in the right way. And um, I've always spent a lot of time uh, trying to seek. Um, uh, feedback and constructive feedback from others so that I can always improve and really noticing when there are opportunities um, when the, the 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 cracks in the doors are open or in the windows you, you I've, I've always taken the approach that um, you're better off walking through those doors that are available to you and exploring whether or not that takes you anywhere um, and I have so many examples of cases where uh, these kinds of opportunities have really um, gotten me into really fascinating spaces. Um, uh, a lot of people often ask me, uh, one of my dear friends is Dikimbi Matumbo and how I came to know uh, Dikimbi. So that's, that's one example which uh, I'd be happy to describe. Um, it was NBA All-Star Weekend, uh, I don't know, about four or five years ago in Toronto. And um, Every NBA All-Star Weekend, the, uh, the uh, NBA has um, a political panel. And uh, the NBA had asked me if by chance I was able to uh, be able to land uh, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, to participate in that panel. And I let them know I would try. And I called the Prime Minister's office and uh, he wasn't available, but they had recommended uh, Christopher Freeland, who... Uh, who graciously agreed to be part of this panel, which was a tremendous panel, including 
Wendy Sherman, um, who now I believe is the number two person at the State Department um, in the United States government right now. Um, and uh, in their appreciation, um, the NBA um, uh, gave me tickets to all of the events and all of the, the games, etc. And sure enough, at the political panel, uh, Dikimi Matumbo was sitting next to me and we began talking and we uh, very quickly realized that we had a lot more in common than just our towering height. And um, he gave me his business card and uh, we agreed to uh, stay in touch. And um, uh, and that was it. A few weeks later, I'm sitting in my office and the phone rings. It was a Wednesday night um, and I'm working away and uh, I pick up the phone and it's the Kimbi Matumbo in his um, really uh, distinctive voice. Hey Jay, it's Matumbo. Um, I'm, I'm going to be in New York tomorrow. That's not far from Toronto, is it? Um, why don't you meet me for dinner? So I had a, I had a choice to make. Um, you know, I had a very full day packed the next day. It would be very inconvenient for me to scramble to get to New York to have dinner. Um, but what I found with people like the Kimbi Mutombo is that um, if you don't take that one opportunity, it'll be lost because they have so many other things on the go and so many other relationships. So I decided to clear my deck and uh, meet with him in uh, Manhattan. We had a great dinner and um, our relationship only grew deeper. And um, we now uh, have a tremendous um, relationship. I help him with his philanthropic work. I bring him into uh, some of the technology and business opportunities that I have. And it's been a wonderful, um, it's been a really wonderful uh, uh, relationship. And that's one of many, many stories I have about really, um, you know, taking the opportunities when, when you see them and, and you just never know where they go from there. So Chica, I, I, I'd be happy to tell uh, one or two more stories um, or we could leave it at that and uh, I can open it up to uh, questions, whatever, uh, whatever you think works best. Thank you so much. Jay, and um, maybe in answering most of the questions or some of the questions here, you might tell right. more of those stories. But thank you so much. Thanks a lot for all you do for the Black community. And um, please put in your questions and using the Q&A uh, box there, just put in some questions. We're not going to let Jay just go free here. OK, guys? Um, Jay, just quickly, um, one thing that, you know, just listening to you and knowing your, you know, what you have done and what you continue to do for our community, I just want to see whether you can give a good example of uh, where it is tough for people. Uh, again, black community folks, um, the doors are always shut for them and all that, you know, in front of them, the windows are shut as well. It's like a black, you know, just tick black uh, hole where they are and struggling. What do you say to them? That's one. Two, you know, how, has, how, how did the Jewish community do it in terms of, you know, based on history here? How did they do it? Because they didn't get it so easy as well, but they now rule these communities. How did they get it? What can we be doing to be there? I, I think, uh, well, there's a lot of questions in there and they're all really, really good questions. And uh, Chica, I, I appreciate that um, uh, you, you highlighted as well. And, and it's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about uh, social justice and social justice for all. Uh, because I think that we're all in it together. Uh, all our communities need to work together to help one another against all forms of, of racism and discrimination. In fact, uh, anti-Semitism is at its highest level today uh, since, since pre-Holocaust, so we need to be very, very vigilant together. Um, you're right, the Jewish community um, uh, was shut out of a lot of opportunities as well. Back in the day, there was a quota at Harvard. Um, there was only a, a, a very small percentage of, uh, of uh, students who were allowed to get in to Harvard. Um, Jews were shut out of uh, working from the banks, working at the banks and, uh, and uh, other, other large corporations. Um, uh, we, we, we ended up uh, pulling money together to, to, to build hospitals and the like because of discrimination that we, that we uh, felt in the, um, in the medical uh, community. Um, I think it's a matter of banding together as one um, and developing organizations where we can uh, find ways to take care of one another 
Um, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, the Jewish community in many ways had no, no choice um, uh, in North America but to, but to start businesses because we were being shut out of the corporate world. So, so out of desperate times, take desperate measures. You know, a lot of people um, in today's day and age talk about, you know, only, only be an entrepreneur if you're passionate about entrepreneurship. Well, there's another kind of entrepreneur, um, and actually Harley Finkelstein over at Shopify, who's had great success himself, he talks about the importance of entrepreneurship by necessity <laughs> for survival. Um, and, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, we could be very proud of our, our community for having um, developed a lot of uh, really interesting businesses and entrepreneurship, but I want to underline that in the Jewish community as well, there, 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 uh, there's a lot of poverty and, um, and, uh, and struggle and, uh, and a lot of people in other communities don't, don't realize that, but we do develop organizations like United Jewish Appeal and the like to try and uh, take care of uh, our community in the best way possible. Um, so what I would say in terms of the opening of doors and, um, and, and trying to break through doors with the, with the mobile apps that we have at our fingertips um, and the prevalence of uh, Web3, which is about to uh, rise to the forefront, if you develop a product that is outstanding, that um, the world needs, um, I believe that um, you will find a way to break through. Um, with the tech world that we're living in now, um, I think innovation is a very, very uh, strong way to rise above some of the obstacles uh, that you are feeling um, and that you're experiencing. It's by no means easy, but I also thank, thank God for um, organizations like Black North and Black Innovation Capital and Ozone X and you know, Rebalance uh, Capital, um, organizations that are not looking at uh, many of them that I name, most of them that I name, they're not looking at investing in those that, who've historically been disadvantaged as a charity in any way. Study after study has shown that um, the more diversity uh, around the business table, the more diversity uh, in terms of building businesses, um, the greater the business results. So there's a very strong business case to be had uh, for helping diverse communities and investing in uh, diverse communities. Of course, you know, the number one important piece of all of this is the moral imperative of equality. But if investors can't wrap their head around that, you can make the business case um, for a great product, a great technology, and the fact that all statistics show that the, the more diverse uh, the, the business, uh, the greater the business results. You know, money does talk. Absolutely. No, money talks indeed. Thank you so much. Uh, Jay, I've got lots of questions here and uh, looking at time. Let's see how many we can take. And I'm going to put this one just straight to you, Jay. It says, can you elaborate on how to overcome the challenges of getting funding, not just from the government, but also from, from banks, especially as a startup, as somebody that is new without credit history? How, how do you do that? The, the most important thing uh, you can do if you're, er, if you're early on, and I'm not saying it's easy, it's, it's, it's much easier said than done, um, but organizations like the ones that I'm a part of, uh, including the venture uh, projects that I'm a part of, um, uh, uh, specifically cater to, um, uh, to individuals who are in those kinds of positions. Um, so what I would say is most importantly, try to find a way to surround yourself with, with great mentors and great advisors who, who they themselves have track records. I've done that in many cases uh, for a number of venture businesses that I'm involved in and, and it's worked out very well for me as well as the founders. Um, so find a way to uh, connect to the right individuals. And, and by the way, like all of you out there are welcome to reach out to me. Uh, I'd be more than happy to be helpful if you have a viable and interesting uh, business. But it, it's very important 
to, de to be able to develop a deck, a presentation deck for investors, um, where you have some critical mass of individuals with track records. Um, and uh, and that's, that's basically the approach that I would take. And never, never, never give up <laughs> is the number one thing I would always say. Keep persevering, keep banging on those doors um, because um, the more that you push and the more enthusiasm you show, eventually I think if you have the right kind of business, it will break through. Thank you so much, Jay. Just another question here. Can you share some lessons that you learned over the years from your social justice career that you carried over and applied to growing businesses? Well, I've learned that um, it's often uh, much easier to accomplish social good um, through for-profit businesses. Um, and so marrying uh, for-profit with purpose or profit and purpose, as I might say, I think is a very effective way of getting things done. Um, so one example uh, in climate change, of course, is uh, an extremely uh, dire existential crisis that we're facing. Um, and uh, I'm on the advisory board of an LA-based organization called Full Cycle, run by a beautiful human being uh, named Ibrahim al Husseini. Ibrahim has a very interesting story himself. He, uh, he was, uh, his parents were uh, Palestinian refugees. He eventually um, made his way to the United States through his own ingenuity and brilliance and was an early investor in companies like Uber and Tesla and did very, very well. A real Renaissance man, he, uh, he was uh, nominated as a producer, a movie producer and TV producer for Emmys and Academy Awards. Um, but at, at his, in his heart, he's an environmentalist. So he developed a, an organization, as I say, called Full Cycle. And Full Cycle is a fund that buys businesses whose mission it is to reverse climate change um, and projects whose mission it is to reverse climate change. One of the businesses, as an example, that, that uh, we've bought turns waste into clean energy. And the interesting thing that he said to me uh, and, it, and it connects to my earlier point about, uh, you know, money talking. <laughs> uh, and that is when he initially went to raise money and he made his presentations, the first slide talked about the, um, the, the environmental crisis that we're all facing. And the second slide talked about the business uh, opportunity, which is a massive one. He was struggling a bit to raise money. But what he decided to do was flip the slides. <laughs> so grab people's attention right away about the multi-billion dollar opportunity that climate change is offering and then talk about the good that it does. Well, sure enough, that, that got him off to the races and uh, it's a really um, successful uh, ongoing uh, fund. I hope Thank that you so yeah. Yeah. No, that's very helpful. Thanks a lot. Very big insights here. Just one more question before we let you go here. Uh, we know you're busy, uh, but uh, your insights are so, so, so well needed here. Um, you talked about board and, and you did talk about uh, people can reach out to you and, and ask questions. And I think that's very generous of you. And believe me, my, my guys are going to do that. People will like to reach out to you, Jay. So, um, you don't scare but, me. No problem. Uh, I know that. So I'm just giving you that warning that is going to come, which is good. So it, it, it dovetails to my next question here, which is, um, you know, you, you're having a startup. The question is, um, how do you ensure that you have good board members? How do you select them, both for profit and not for profit? You're just a small business guy. Usually you have your own family members and all that. But in this business world, you need better people and all that. How do you go about that? Well, it's important, first of all, to, uh, to identify whatever field you're in. Who are the experts in, in that field? Academically, investors, entrepreneurs who've previously had great success in that sector. And um, if you have full confidence in the business that you're developing and the idea that you have, you find ways, and given the technology we all have our, at, our, at our fingertips, 
there are ways, even, even if it means direct messaging through LinkedIn or whatever it might be, you find ways to approach um, these experts and these highly credible and prominent individuals to present them the case uh, of your business and invite them to somehow be involved. And if you think that these individuals are, are important enough uh, to taking your business to the next level, from the point of view of advising you, from the point of view of the public face of the names that are part of your business, then you, you offer them shares if you need to. Um, and uh, again, if it's a really credible business and you're a credible person and somebody's being offered shares or, and or money um, without having to invest, that's a pretty compelling offer. And um, you'd be surprised. You, you, you'll be able to develop a board that uh, is truly um, quite powerful. And again, you know, leverage off of the, the um, opportunities and the organizations that, are, that continuously sprout over the last few years um, that are geared very specifically toward investing in, in, in young people like, like those who are in the audience. That's what we're here for. Um, and uh, as I say, you know, these are good business opportunities for us as well. These aren't charities. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jay. Some of the questions here, we're going to answer them uh, just uh, through emails and all that, but uh, lots of questions, which is very, very encouraging. And, you know, it's not often that we catch somebody like Jay to talk to us and to share his experiences. Thank you so much, Jay. And uh, I know you'll be hanging around just uh, watching over what we're doing. We may call on you again. Um, again, thank you so much for all you do for us. And uh, let's keep chatting. My pleasure. Great to see you. Very well. Good night, everyone. Okay. Now and I'm going to invite my friend and colleague, uh, Chi Leah, to take over. Chi, please. Thank you, Dr. Chika. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our esteemed panelists. But before I do that, let me just say thank you again to Jay. That was an awesome session for us. And so I'll start by introducing Michaela McFasson. She, she be began her journey with BMO in 2013 as a customer service representative. In 2015, she, made, she moved on to a personal, ba personal banker role. And more recently, in 2021, joined the Canadian Business Banking Division. She's a graduate from the School of Business of Montreal University with a major in general management. So with over seven years of bank lending experience, it's one of her favorite aspects of the finance industry. She's, a, she's proudly Calgarian, born and raised. She enjoys spending time with her two young boys, traveling and building her shoe collection. That's a woman after my own heart. Welcome, Michaela. Thank you for being here. So now I would like to introduce Oba Harden. He is a senior business officer with Prairie Economic Development of Canada. He holds degrees from the University of British Columbia, the University of Edinburgh, and Simon Fraser University. He worked as a funder in innovation for over 10 years across British Columbia and Alberta, consulting with companies and academics to support hundreds of research and development and commercialization projects. He has strong convictions about R&D as a driver of innovation and has worked across government agencies and industry groups to help businesses access grants and loans for growth and expansion. When he's not at work or listening to an audiobook, he spends time on the turntables as a DJ sharing his love, his lifelong love of music. Welcome, Oba. Our next panelist is Liz McCray. She's a certified exit planning advisor and the co-founder of a tech startup called Village Wealth, a digital acquisition platform built to connect buyers of small businesses to the business for sale ecosystem. After missing the opportunity to take over her father's company due to a lack of succession planning, Liz and her husband, Scott, ventured into business ownership by purchasing a franchise. The experience of starting a new franchise and coming full circle to sell it led her into the business succession space. 
Liz and Scott's finance and franchise experience was not as they had imagined it would be. And in hindsight, they know now they would have purchased an existing business over starting the franchise that they did. Over the last 10 years, Liz has acquired and exited two companies and leaves to tell the tales. She's an active speaker and is passionate about sharing the advantages and process of business acquisition with aspiring entrepreneurs and founders alike. Welcome, Liz. And the last but definitely not the least is Charles Osuji. He's a multi-award winning lawyer and the CEO of Osuji and Smith Law Firm in Calgary. He was recently chosen as one of Calgary's top 40 under 40 and one of the top 25 most influential lawyers in Canada. Outside his legal practice, Charles spends his time mentoring other young professionals, running a free legal clinic which primarily serves Calgary's newcomer population and volunteering with his church. He also enjoys being with family and friends, playing the piano and playing and watching soccer. Welcome, Charles. And so because of time, we're gonna go right into our questions. And so my first question is open to any of the panelists. And so in less than two minutes, could you make an opening comment on the theme of our conference today? Could you include like a sentence on what needs to be done to close the racial wealth gap in Canada. And we, I can start by calling on Oba, if you want to go. Sure, I'm happy to start things off. Um, you know, there's no easy answers here. There's no easy path. Um, but I believe in the conversation with Jay, uh, you know, a brief comment came up, but I think it's important. You know, we live in a capitalist society in this part of the world and and capital and funding and investment will chase good business ideas and great business execution and so there are a number of opportunities here um you know in my role i work as a funder i work with the government uh, we evaluate projects we do our due diligence in many of the same way angel investors would look uh, pre-seed capital uh, venture capitalists it's really a matter of risk and how do we assess that risk but where we see good business opportunities we put monies in either directly into companies or into organizations that support that and so i think one of the best ways to address uh, the successes is to really talk about the excess success where we achieve that success it has to be touted it has to be advertised and good money will follow good projects and good businesses um, but it also has to be visible. And I think there are some challenges with the black community. I, I looked up some high level stats in this country. We have 3.5% of the country, a uh, 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 black population, and that's relatively low. So while we see media messages of trying to get the visibility of black people out there and the humanity of black people out there, um, I would like to see increases in the, the, the advertising and promotion of success of black businesses. Some of that is through discussion. Some of that is through advertising or other channels. Some of that, some of that is through the communities. We see that through some of our programming. There's strong knit communities around church or around certain immigrant groups or populations. But to talk that up, to tout it, and then also to contribute. There are a number of people on this call that are looking for help, but there's a number of people on this call who have something to offer. And I think it... it it serves us all to think about what can we contribute to. When we say a board, <laughs> I see different kinds of boards. I see boards of directors, but there's also boards of advisors. And this is not a forever thing. There are ways to contribute to a board of advisors to many early stage companies that need advice at different times and at different stages. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there, a lot of to unpack, but I'll, I'll stop for now. Thank you, Oba, thank you so much. Um, Michaela, do you wanna go next? I'll keep mine very short and sweet. <laughs> so I think that um, things like this conference, so this conference will hopefully make attendees feel more confident, knowledgeable, and ready to move forward in their journeys as entrepreneurs. And I think that that's exactly what we need um, to close that racial wealth gap in Canada is just investing time and knowledge into black communities in Canada um, to help them to thrive in their industries of choice and create generational wealth. 
Um, so I, I believe things exactly like what we're doing here today will, will help local communities and across Canada even um, to succeed. Liz, do you have anything else to add? Sure, I will echo what Jay said as well. Like entrepreneurship is, is not easy. And, you know, at, at, at the many different stages of development of, of, of a business, you know, there's the, the right chasing capital at the right time and the right stage of the development of, of the company. And I think, you know, in any state, um, you need to find those mentors and you need to find um, those examples. Um, and, and like Owa said too, like, you know, there's people that are looking for help and there's people that can give help. And if you're not finding the examples out there then become, become, become the example that you want to see and, and be loud about it and be proud about it. And, and I think, you know, as an entrepreneur sometimes, and I'm guilty of this too, I'm too, I'm too quiet. And, you know, and it's the women in, in my own space, um, I'm not loud enough. And, and Charles is very good at celebrating his wins and, and being proud of his accomplishments. And I think we could all learn from that as well. You know, if we're not seeing those examples out there, be those examples and, and find them to follow on LinkedIn and, and like, like events like this, like Michaela said, like find those um, existences of community, uh, peer groups, podcasts, uh, you know, LinkedIn, just people on LinkedIn and, and follow them and watch them. Thank you. Charles, do you want to add anything? Absolutely. Uh, I think this calls for a change of mindset. Um, over the years, we've been talking about being invited to the table. I think it's high time we, we started talking about building our own table. Um, and no matter how small the table is, you build it, people are watching, people are being motivated, people are being inspired. And it starts, you start small. And that is how, um, in my mind, the, the wealth gap is bridged. One table at a time. I like that. One table at a time. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go to the next question. Michaela, this question is for you. So I'm just going to be picking on you guys because I have the, I have the opportunity to do that, right? So I'll just pick on whoever I like and then you guys will just oblige me. So Michaela, the next question is for you. So in 2021, the Canadian federal government created the $221 million Black Entrepreneurship Loan Fund, following which, following which Bank of Montreal announced funding of about $100 million to provide Black entrepreneurs with greater access to working capital and educational resources. Can you please provide information on how Bank of Montreal is administering this funding including eligibility criteria and what black business owners should be doing to access such working capital or resources to build their businesses. So I know the black entrepreneurship fund is very long awaited and there's lots of details that I can share and I'm, I'm going to try to give as much detail as possible here uh, for the attendees. Of course, if there's more questions, you can reach out for sure. Um, but just a high level overview as all I'll try to give to. Um, so, of course, BMO was recognized uh, that Black entrepreneur segments um, are very un underserved in the banking industry. Um, so because of this, a lot of Black business owners end up financing everything themselves. Uh, this creates a lot of barriers for growth within certain industries. Um, so with that being said, the, the loan program itself, it does offer up to $250,000 uh, to Black business owners. Um, it includes existing businesses as well as startups. Um, and because the standard underwriting processes can bring up barriers to minority-owned um, businesses, the program itself does provide flexibility on the underwriting procedures to better cater to the applicants who need it. Um, so some different points in regards to the program itself. Uh, I'll start off just with eligibility. Um, so the type of candidate uh, that would apply under this program. So eligibility would be uh, the business has to be a Canadian owned uh, business with majority ownership of 51% by a self-declared Black Canadian. Uh, the owner must be minimum 18 years old uh, and controlled by a legal resident in Canada. The annual revenues can't exceed $10 million Canadian. 
Um, so startups are included and they are considered as startups if they have been operating for less than 24 months. Um, existing businesses are defined as operating for more than 24 months uh, with a minimum of one year of financial statements uh, prepared that they can give the bank. Um, so amounts available for startups are a minimum $25,000 to $100,000. Um, and for existing businesses, the minimum is $25,000 to $250,000. Um, if we're thinking about working capital loans, the maximum that we give under this program for that is $100,000. So permitted uses of the funds. Um, under the program would be for capital investments. Uh, so that would include equipment, leasehold improvements, uh, improvements to properties, um, office equipment, of course, working capital, which would be inventory, payroll, payments on your lease, um, and account management. Um, and of course, just a reminder, this caps at $100,000 for working capital. Um, Non-permitted uses. So that would be considered as using the funds to restructure um, business related debts. Um, so non-performing loans, dividend payouts, shareholder loan repayments, um, issuing shareholder loans, bonuses, things like that, uh, as well as real estate and agricultural financing are not included under this program. Of course, we offer that just outside of um, the Black Entrepreneurship Program itself. Um, when it comes to the guarantor of the loan, so the program does have minimum requirements. Um, so for established business owners, they do need to have a credit score of 620 uh, with a personal net worth of greater than zero. For a startup owner, they need a score of 640 uh, with a personal net worth equal to or greater than the loan amount that they're applying for. Um, there cannot be any bankruptcies or charge-offs within the last three years and there's no outstanding majors on your credit bureau um, which is allowed which would be considered as having something as a 90 day or more delinquent status of a credit facility on your bureau um, there's also no exceptions to the above under this program um, the option of the products that we offer under this program for the loan would include non-revolving loans, uh, as well as revolving credit lines, which those are being added to the program sometime this year, um, which would be like a business line of credit type product. Um, the amortization on the loan itself will depend on what it's being financed for. Um, so for example, equipment, we would amortize over the life of the equipment, or 10 years, whatever is greater. Uh, for leasehold improvements, it would amortize over the equal of the lease term uh, of the business itself, plus any renewal options, but that's up to a maximum of 10 years as well. Um, the term of the loan is a maximum of five years. So that would be discussed with your banker uh, when you're, you're going through the program itself. Um, let me think. So some unique features as well. Sorry, my light here just went off. We'll continue in the dark. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, so for the unique features of the program, which differentiate it just from a regular business banking loan, or let's say a Canada small business financing um, loan, so unique features in regards to that would be uh, this program offers interest only payments within the first year of acquiring the loan, which is great, uh, especially for startup businesses. That helps a lot when you're covering a lot of different costs um, for that, as well as the application fees uh, for the loan itself are capped at $250 which for a regular banking loan or business loan, sorry, um, that's at a 50% discount of the minimum that we would charge for a business banking loan um, of $500. So that's capped at 250 under the program. Um, the interest rate also under the Black Entrepreneurship Program is capped at prime plus 4%. Um, that can impact, um, or sorry, make an impact um, because rates do fluctuate and can be higher than this based on risk and credit history outside of this program. If you're just to apply for a regular loan, um, rates could definitely go higher um, 
of than prime plus four. So it is capped at that under this program. Um, security under the program is very standard, uh, which would be a first position uh, general security agreement, which would be needed over the business's assets, as well as a full covering personal guarantee, uh, which would cover 100% of the loan itself. So depending on each scenario as well, additional security could also be needed. Um, in order to access this program, just to wrap it up as well, uh, I would reach out to any BMO representative uh, if you do know one. <laughs> uh, and if you don't, uh, my email will be provided um, to reach out uh, after the session for sure. Um, there also is a general inquiry email located on the BMO for Black Entrepreneurs section of the BMO website um, that can be reached out to as well. And if you're reaching out through that general email, depending on where you're located in Canada, they will align you with the best um, the best relationship manager in your area uh, that can give you more, more uh, details on the loan or answer any questions you have and then eventually start the application for you as well too. Okay. So that's my overview for that program. Thank you, Michaela. That's very helpful. And it sounds pretty straightforward. We'll come back to you to ask if there's any catch, anything you haven't said, because that sounds pretty straightforward. Like call Michaela if you don't know any other BMO rep and get the loan, right? That's kind of like how you sounded there. Just provide all the documents and get a loan. But Oba, do you have any any thoughts? Is there anything else you'd like to add to what Michaela just said? Yeah, I love to hear you say that about Michaela. They usually say that about me because I'm also <laughs> <a friend. laughs> just just one call, one call. Right? Um, I I want to check in on one thing with you, Michaela. Uh, make sure I didn't miss it. Is the loan program eligible for sole proprietorships? Oh, okay, okay, that's that's pretty advantageous. And the reason why I ask that is, um, so the, the comment was made that uh, this, this uh, Black, Entrepre Black Entrepreneurship Loan Fund was $221 million. And I'm gonna come at it from a, a bit of a different angle, which is interesting. Um, my, my work with a regional development agency, we have kind of three groups that we serve. There are communities, and that can be, divine, that can be defined by kind of geographic location. Um, but there is also entrepreneur innovation ecosystems. So it's usually we're talking about a technology vertical, could be clean tech, could be uh, health and life sciences technologies. I do a lot of work there. And also with digital technologies and different slants. Um, and then of course, companies, we also fund them as well. Um, it was a little over a year ago when I first got involved with this, specifically the Black Entrepreneurship Program. And so the loan fund is one of three programs and I wanted to point out kind of the bigger picture here. So the loan fund is 221 million, but the overall package of the programs rolled out was 265. So there's another $44 million out there and the obvious questions for what? So this is where I play a little bit and how I got involved is I work in innovation ecosystems a lot with technology businesses. One of the way to develop new sectors or to support sectors of the economy is we build up an innovation ecosystem. And, and what does that mean? It's, it's typically not for profits. So sometimes those are business accelerators, incubators, uh, industry associations, sometimes they're post-secondaries, uh, so post-secondary institutions. But what I would put out to the group here is that there is an opportunity here to build an innovation ecosystem. And there's actually kind of a dual opportunity. There is working within that black community, which we are, we're having a discussion right now, but there's also the broader innovation ecosystem, depending on which sector you play in. And the reason why I asked about sole proprietorships is that uh, is often a tough space for us to support. And it comes down to risk. If, if if we're going to support a business, we're looking at uh, the expertise of a team or a board of advisors or directors that's already gone up, come up. But those aren't the only ways to bring in expertise into a company. You can bring that into, uh, you can bring it in through an innovation ecosystem. So um, I was typing something in here in the Q&A. Uh, there was a question raised here by Taiwo and I, <laughs> forgive me, I did the wrong thing initially. I, I missed answer the question, but it's under the answered questions. And right now I'm sending a link. I really wanted to share a link about the innovation ecosystem players that I work with, 
or that are available nationally. These are not-for-profits that are in the space that are providing business expertise. And so as much as it's about growing your individual business, we are talking about growing a community, leveraging the knowledge and expertise of each other. And we fund, my, my whole point here is that I've, we've had $44 million to put out there into the ecosystem to support not-for-profits that want to connect with you. And how I got involved is um, essentially there are some black led uh, technology accelerators or online service providers in Alberta. I'll speak to the two that I work with directly, the Black Business Ventures Association and also BIPOC Foundation. Um, but the link that I've shared in the Q&A actually shows the recipients across the country by province of those organizations um, that have received funding from us to deliver fees or sorry to deliver programs to you at no additional fee or cost we, we're subsidizing that cost that's access to training um, whether it's technical uh, what do you need for incorporation documents what do you need to think about legal or accounting sometimes they will provide those services or provide them at discount but the whole point of that program was to reach out to black entrepreneurs to help provide these resources if not the capital directly I like to think of it as an indirect way of accessing government programs and grants. And there are those direct applications. That is an opportunity. You should pursue them. But there is also these organizations that are out there fighting on behalf of Black businesses and entrepreneurs to access these resources. And these projects are approved. The money is out there. That link that I put in the Q&A um, will show you where they are across the country. And so the last thing I'll say in this vein is um, I do a lot of work in life sciences and health technologies and their path to market is very long, uh, very expensive. <laughs> um, and, and there are many challenges in that space. In the last little while, we've started to rethink how do we help those companies get to market? And I'll flip the question in terms of how do we make these businesses more investable? And I'm seeing that with the ecosystem providers that I'm working with. Many of them are working with sole proprietorships. They're working with companies that are early stage. Technology has its challenges. There's direct competition, indirect. But let's rethink, how do we make our Black businesses investable at certain stages? There are series stages, there's pre-seed, there's seed. And think of them as milestones or even steps to get to. And, and even the advisors or directors that you need at a certain step may not be at a subsequent step. There is turnover, and, and that's for good reason. But if we start to reframe how we think about achieving that subsequent investment just to get to one step and advance, and one step to advance, I think we can see progress there. The other thing I'd say is that I would really love entrepreneurs to reach out to these organizations because I mentioned something about visibility. The, the, the government doesn't always have great line of sight on how many Black businesses are out there. Are they in certain sectors? Is there a trend here? Are we seeing a growth trend? Is there an investment opportunity? The reason why we put $44 million out into the system is that we think that there is an investable aspect here. We think that there is uh, something to be had. But we need to know who these businesses are. What are the other gaps? What are we missing? And... There's a longevity piece too. too. As, as far as I'm aware, the, this program is unprecedented. We've never put out this amount of money towards Black people and Black entrepreneurs and Black communities. But of course, we're going to expect a return on that investment, and we need to understand what it is. It's not always as simple as ticking a box to say we generated X number of dollars of revenue, but that's going to be conversational. Uh, it's more than we can grasp here, but I encourage you, please reach out to these organizations and become visible. We need to know you, understand your story, and if there isn't enough funding today or if you're growing to tomorrow, we need to know about that as well. Thank you, Ob. I like that. Innovation ecosystem. I didn't know about that. So, like, that's another 44 million out there. So, we need to take the money. It's out there for taking. So, let's use it. it. Is. Yes. So awesome. Thank you so much. And so my next question will go to Liz, and this has to do with business acquisition. And so I just, when I introduced you, I talked to, we talked about starting a franchise and you realizing quickly that maybe you should have bought an existing business. So 
can you like can you explain to us like what are the advantages of business acquisition as against starting from scratch or purchasing a franchise what are the pitfalls we we need to know because i know it's common knowledge that black entrepreneurs we because of the lack of capital access to capital we tend to start our own business so can you just provide some insight there yeah for sure i'll start by kind of premising what's happening in um in the ecosystem i'll throw that word out as well like hoba the the we we call it the acquisition ecosystem as well in our world um and there and there are layers and and members like yourself chi and, and charles being lawyers you are in our our ecosystem as well um and so you know bdc has put out studies in the last five years that that lay the 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 data around um, what's happening for existing business owners. And, and because of the baby boomer generation, we are almost in this bubble of business succession. So um, even Ob and I are attending a conference right now and they spoke yesterday about the $70 trillion worth of business transfer that is happening right now. So from the study done in 2017 by BDC, which is now outdated and COVID has likely thrown off these numbers. Um, but in that study, they, they had indicated that uh, it's 40% of businesses would transact and or, tr or look to transition ownership within the next five years. So already we're five years from that. That study also indicated that 70% of business owners within the next 10 years would look to transition their ownership. 50% of those that population of business owners would look to um, look for succession solutions outside of family. So the typical, you know, succession solutions are family management or to a third party. And so you're looking at 55, 50% of, of those transitioning businesses going to outside family. A lot of them will transition to current employees or management teams, um, but a great number of them are coming up for sale um, and, and it's an underground market. It's, they don't advertise that they're for sale. Um, it's a confidential process that's managed almost behind closed doors. And so my company, Village Wealth, we are advocates of uh, what's called acquisition entrepreneurship. And it's a different segue, it's a different avenue into entrepreneurship. And what happens is you kind of the, the stages that Oba was discussing about startups and seed round and that kind of thing, um, you skip those stages. And, you know, buying an existing business, and, and Jay alluded to it too, and he was kind of throwing out some bigger acquisition companies and, oh, this company acquiring this, and we're acquiring, you know, energy and green tech and that kind of thing. And that's the stuff that hits the media. But what doesn't hit the papers and the media outlets, and I, I say newspapers, <laughs> you know, the, the, all, the, all the news media outlets is, uh, is the companies that are, you know, typically referred to as main street or lower middle market companies. And those would typically be companies that generate less than 10 million in revenue. So these is, but, but what happens at this end of the market is there are more of these companies. There are more of these companies than there are larger companies that you hear about in the media. And these companies, their, their owners are retiring and they're looking for somewhere to put them. But the conundrum is that they don't tell anyone. And so where our company um, gets positioned and, and I came to this we came to this arriving at our, our tech company um, through experience. I have three other partners. Um, and it was that there was this great opportunity to expose this um, acquisition entrepreneurship pathway. And um, one of the alternative um, solutions to capital is that there are banking programs that will finance um, purchasers, buyers, I'll call them buyers, to buy these existing businesses. So for example, BDC will finance up to, in some cases, up to 75% of that business purchase. And, you know, the National Bank will finance up to 60% if you're an outside buyer and up to 70% if you're a manager, management trying to buy into this company. The other two methods of financing small business acquisition is one is through finding equity partners. So bringing in investors to co-invest with you to cover that down payment portion. So if you're looking at, you know, if, if a purchaser is responsible for 25 to 40% of that business purchase, uh, you can find co-investors for that amount. And if you don't have that full amount yourself. 
the third method is through seller financing and technic technically called vendor financing. And you guys coming from the legal world, <laughs> you would see this a lot as well, um, that there is a component of this financing where there is no exchange of a money of, of, of funds at closing, but you pay the exiting business owner over a period of time under a different, a different set of structures. And so there are instances where you can buy a business with almost no money down, no, none of your own money down. You have to qualify under certain conditions, but it is possible. And there are lots of stories coming out, predominantly coming out of the US because they have different access to capital. So in the US, um, you need as little as 10% to buy an existing company. And in Canada, we don't have um, that many programs established, um, but banks will finance business acquisition because it's less risky. They have already, you know, validation for product. The companies are established. They've got, you know, the, that three to five year history um, that the banks are looking for when they're looking to finance. Um, they've got product market fit. You've got existing clients, existing customers. You've got sales and revenue coming in from day one. You have trained staff uh, that, that know the industry and the company very well. And you are stepping in almost as a CEO uh, on day one. So it's, it's an avenue to entrepreneurship that is much less known about, but it is very possible. And there's, there's some great books out there that are written on it. There are, there's a, a lot of YouTubers that are coming out and talking about this. Um, I watched a really fascinating interview, um, uh, um, interviewing a black entrepreneur last week. Um, and the podcast was called, um, it's on YouTube and it was called Acquiring Minds. And it was a relatively new podcast. So if you, if you YouTube it, you'll be able to see a lot of those interviews. There's just about 20 interviews. Um, and the black entrepreneur that was getting interviewed was, um, you know, he lived in California. He made an acquisition in Florida and it, he purchased it for under a million dollars and it was in commercial cleaning. So, you know, these, these aren't fancy businesses, but the business models are prime for innovation and they're prime for adaptability and pivoting and all these words that we buzzwords that we've heard coming out of the pandemic. Um, you know, a lot of these business models have not had technology implemented in them. So there is a great opportunity in this time right now to innovate these businesses and, and bring new methods and business models um, into the space. And um, there's, in general, it, most people aren't aware that this is an avenue to entrepreneurship. And that's, that's what we do. Hey, I, that's awesome. I took away buying a business without putting any money down. They just sound amazing. <laughs> I'm like equity partnership right there, getting bank to finance 70%, seller financing. I'm like, okay, these are awesome stuff. I don't need to have like a million dollars to get into a business. And so I think that brings me to Charles. My next question is like, what motivated you to, I'm going to use the word start your own business here. And but what are the challenges that you faced as a black man? How do you, how did you overcome them? What are the challenges you're still facing? It's almost like that ties into what Liz talked about, about like acquiring like a business. So if you can just. Right, absolutely. Um, Liz is, is quite accurate. There's another pathway to entrepreneurship, which is uh, buying into an existing business. Uh, that was what I did a few years back. Um, of course, predominantly I did it out of survival, but most importantly, um, I, I did it because of my experience. When I came here, um, some years back, I was looking for articles. Articles is internship for lawyers. Uh, you would send out you know, tons of applications and nobody would even acknowledge the application um, because you're applying to people that don't know where you went to school. Um, they don't understand your heritage. They don't know your story. So it was, it was a struggle. And you're comp I was competing with folks uh, that either were born and raised here, they do have the tribal connections, uh, they've gone to school here, they have all of these webs and, um, of, of connections. So the opportunity came about to um, purchase my firm in 2017. And that was at the, at the back of my mind to uh, give people the opportunity that they didn't have. And I took over when we were just two lawyers. Now there's 20 of, 20 of us, um, uh, barely four years later. And I have plans to double that. So motivation was predominantly 
um, significance and relevance and giving people a headway, giving people an opportunity, especially people that have um, systemic barriers facing them, um, um, barriers and access to, to employment, licensing or whatnot. But that decision didn't come with challenges. Um, the first challenge I had was fear. Um, <laughs> I was afraid that I was um, gonna make a fool of myself by, by um, taking up that kind of challenge. Um, but ultimately, uh, I was able to overcome that by having very strong support network. Um, I, I could say that I have some of them listening. I have Bruce Randall here, I have Dr. Chika. Okay, these are folks that you go to with things that you think um, are humongous and then they trivialize it, simplify it, and tell you that you can do it, you're a star, you're, you're a rock star. Um, you know, when the opportunity to buy the firm came about, I ran to Bruce thinking that he was going to validate my fear and tell me to run very far away from that opportunity. Um, but the opposite was the case. He told me that the words that would happen would go to the bank and borrow money, right? So he simplified it and I, and I took his word for it and here we are today. Another challenge was access to capital. Um, some of these barriers are very systemic. You know, you go to the bank, they're asking you for history and all of that. And sometimes you're a newcomer, you haven't had the opportunity to build um, the history. I remember going to a few banks at the time and they wouldn't even look at my application because I didn't have anything behind the application. I didn't have any history. It took one lady um, from your bank, Michaela. <laughs> yeah, it took one lady to ignore what the paperwork was saying, to ignore the ink on paper and look at the drive and, and the fire in my eyes and give me a shot, you know, and, and here we are today. Another way I overcame my challenges was having faith um, in, in my ability to be a good entrepreneur and focusing on excellence. Uh, I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, it's one thing to, you know, complain about the color of your skin, the sound of your voice, your heritage, where you come from. It's another thing to do something about it and overcome by having your, uh, having the right mindset towards providing services, which is focusing on excellence. Um, if your contemporary is putting in 100%, you put in 200%. If your contemporary is putting in five days a week, you put in seven days a week. Um, so that was the strategy I utilized at the very beginning. I put in the hours, seven days a week, um, countless hours, countless resources, because I knew that at the end of the day, if I was able to focus on being better, if I was able to focus on excellence, um, there's a lot of silver lining that comes with it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Charles. That's really inspiring. And I'm going to come back to something you said about barriers. I'm going to talk, speak to Liz, but before I... Um, go to that question. We have a question from the audience to Michaela, and it's, if you have a startup company with two Canadian partners, 60, 40 shareholding, can you advise um, which of their credit scores will form the basis for the loan qualification? So typically for that, we would pull bureaus for each guarantor, um, and then we would use the one that has the highest score, honestly. Um, to, for the qualification of the loan. The only time that that differs is if the guarantors or shareholders are married. Um, in that case, this is, I don't know if this is insider information, but um, in that case, the, if they're married, it would be whichever spouse has the lower scores who we would consider. Um, if there's certain factors as to why the score is lower, like let's say um, they're new to Canada and they don't have much history and their score is therefore lower than their partners, that would just be something that we would send in as an exception to credit on why we believe we should be using the other spouse's credit score um, as the main one instead. But typically it's the highest score that we would use and we would pull each bureau for, for the guarantors on the loan. Okay, thank you. So Liz, to the question that um, came up when Charles was speaking about these barriers, as a woman, you seem to be navigating the raising of capital, like are the banks not seeing that you're a woman? Like what's going on? Like how are you able to 
raise capital for your business acquisition, not being a man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be honest. We have not gone after bank debt yet. So this is my third business. The first business I had being our franchise, like it was a, it was, it was a franchise. There's a, a, some existence of a, you know, an existing brand, but that's still a startup. So we couldn't get, we couldn't get a business loan for that startup at that time. Um, we got personal lines of credit to buy our franchise. Um, and then in my second business, uh, I purchased it through um, seller financing and paid the exiting um, owner in, in that regard. And now being in my third business, this is the first company that I've been in and we're a tech company. So the path can be a little bit different because, you know, that product market fit and, and, and being revenue, um, revenue positive is, can be a different journey because we're not directly selling a product or a service. Um, and so the way that we started is we bootstrapped and four of us invested, uh, you know, a bit of capital that we had on our own. And then we, we went um, and, and raised money from investors. And that was a learning curve um, for myself. Um, and to be honest, all of my partners as well. Um, uh, one of my partners had, had a tech background. He had done another platform. Um, he is a man, uh, but we are, we are 50, 50. Um, and one of my partners is, a uh, is, uh, is East Indian. Um, and we're about 30% of our team. We're a team of eight now, about 30%, 30 to 40% of our team are people of color and 30 to 40% of our investors are people of color as well. So um, when Oba spoke about those rounds of raising, we are, we have done a seed round and we have 13 investors. Um, man, that was a learning curve. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like it, it is, it is not easy. This is, um, this is a journey to learn how to raise capital um, and learn how to approach the banks and speak to the bank language um, in our acquisition ecosystem. When we now, now we're in a position where we're recommending when people um, are in our, our, our journey around buying a business, we have those partners in place where we recommend that they go speak to those partners because we have relationships with some of the banks. Um, mm -hmm. We also utilize uh, finance consultants. So people who have left banking and kind of gone out and said, you know, people need more help, you know, navigating the banking systems and their fee for service consultants. And sometimes, you know, depending on what someone is going to them for, they will actually hold the hold hold their hand their client's hand and walk them into the bank and kind of try and um, you know distill and translate what they're hearing from the banks um, and 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 walking them through how to understand that language. Um, I did get some advice from from and I can't remember who gave me this advice, but they said they said don't wait to approach investors and the banks when you need the money. They said, start earlier. So go and start to build those relationships before you need the money, because you need to know how to build your company in a way to get there so that when you do need the money, it's a matter of picking up the phone call and, and saying, here's my information. I'm ready. Here's my, I, I need to apply for this money now. Um, and that was some of the best advice that I feel that we got um, because I've, I've applied for a lot of grants and with my previous company as well, like I was applying for women's grants and I was applying for, um, I, I didn't apply for any business loans, but I did. And even when the pandemic came out, I looked at the criteria and I'm like, I don't fit. Um, and I was, I'm, I'm still getting no's and we're still applying for grants and getting no's, but we're getting better at it but it, it's a journey to understand the financing world. Thank you, but that's good to know. At least we, I'm hearing that options out there don't have to go to the banks. It talked about raising money from investors, but before I hit that, I have a quick question for Michaela. Like what insights can you provide on how most Canadian banks will measure credit worthiness? Like what black owned business entrepreneurs should be, should, should work on in order to, for these banks not to consider their businesses to be higher risk? So this will be pretty general. Um, I've worked with BMO for nine years, including the retail space as well as the business space now and working with mortgages and loans and all of that stuff. Um, and there's just very similar themes throughout. 
Um, so I would say any loan in general, whether that's a line of credit, mortgage, business loan, uh, you want to make sure that your personal credit history is in line. Um, so as soon as the bank, when we pull a bureau, as soon as we see any majors or even things as little as minors um, on your bureau, that will raise a red flag when we're either trying to submit it or if a credit partner has to look at it. Um, so things like that would include late payments on credit facilities, on credit cards, as well as phone bills are included on your uh, credit bureau. Uh, delinquent statuses, which would mean that a facility hasn't been paid in over three months. Um, and of course, any items that would have gone off to co collections would raise a red flag um, when we pull up a bureau. So avoiding these, I think, would be the number one thing um, to avoid the banks being cautious uh, when it comes to your credit worthiness. Um, so just speaking on that as well would be try not to open a large amount of credit facilities on your bureau, uh, whether that's credit cards, lines of credits, just getting loans at every different place. Um, really advise against that. Um, not only will it crowd your bureau, but it also shows us multiple inquiries on your bureau as well from different lenders, um, which would make you look like a credit seeker, um, which is another red flag when we're looking at loans. And that can also lower your score um, and when you go into actually needing that, that uh, loan. Uh, like Liz said, if you're waiting and applying once you really need the loan, red flags could, could stop you from getting it at that time when you really need it. Um, so if possible as well, try not to max out your credit cards or credit lines, um, any revolving credit really, as we look at your utilization as well. Um, so utilization is the percentage of your credit limit that you're actually using. Um, um, of a credit card or something like that that is open. So high utilization can actually lead to an automatic decline on an application too. Um, so try to avoid that as well. If something is automatically declined for that reason too, it doesn't mean that we can't put a case forward um, to get to turn it around, but it, it, it can come up right off the bat. Um, so good debt to consider when we're thinking about credit worthiness would obviously be having a mortgage. Um, that's good debt that we like to see on your bureau because um, that can also contribute to your net worth, right? Uh, which is another thing that we look at all the time when you're applying for a loan is your net worth. Um, having a positive net worth shows that you have fallback in the case for whatever reason, if you, you can't, you can't pay the loan or the business can't pay the loan, having fallback or equity um, shows the bank that it's secure in lending out money, basically, um, which that also ties to guarantees. Uh, when you sign for loans as an entrepreneur, uh, you have to guarantee your business loan personally, um, meaning that if the business doesn't pay, you will personally be able to secure it uh, with your own assets. Um, so as well, net worth can be built by having savings and investments too, not all properties as well. Um, but purchasing a home can build that equity, uh, which opens up possibilities to using equity towards injecting towards the business if you needed to, um, or other financing needs as well in your life. Um, loans secured by homes as well, or using properties equity typically offers lower rates. Uh, than if you're applying for a personal loan, as well as even business loans themselves sometimes, um, because they're deemed as less risky by having a, a property secured against the loan. Um, I, I'd say that those are probably the major things that we look at when thinking about credit worthiness specifically at the bank. Okay, thank you, that's really helpful. So don't go around getting loans everywhere. It's not good for you. Don't overutilize your credit line. At least I took away a couple of things to <laughs> hear. And Lisa, quick question for, from the audience for you. Do you have a directory of businesses that are available for purchase? Because I know you mentioned that they are kind of like secret things out there that mm -hmm. people don't know about. Is there a place where like we can look for them? Yeah, you can start your search at Village Wealth. The way that our platforms work is that you register as a buyer. So there's two ways to use our platform. And 
for the record, wealth is spelled W-E-L-L-T-H, um, not the proper way. Um, it's our <laughs> caveat. People are like, do you know you spelled it wrong? We're like, yes, we we're aware. Um, uh, so you reg- the way that our platform works is you register as a buyer and you register your search criteria. And then so sellers can come on and they don't have to list their business for sale. They can, they can register with us discreetly and then they can access you. They can request to connect with you because they'll see if you match based on your search criteria. The other thing that we do is we do list businesses for sale on our platform. And we then, there are a lot of different um, mar- business for sale marketplaces. So we actually aggregate those, a, a lot of the big marketplaces so that buyers can come to Village Wealth and they can almost like a one-stop shop. So they can cool. find businesses for sale that are pulled from other sites, almost like Trivago, like you, you know, and then you're pushed to those sites through us. Um, one really great one um, that came out of the States in the last few years is called Micro Acquire. It's one of the ones that we pull from. Um, and those are startups that are actually for sale. So you can buy a business um, for like one that's almost like in the earlier startup stage. But if you wanted to kind of, you know, play around with the concept for a very sm- much smaller investment, some of the small micro businesses that are you know, earlier on, you can find them on, on platforms like that. So we pull from a lot of different places. And then we also are capturing private deal flow that doesn't hit the market mm-hmm. because we have it set up where you can search for buyers. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, so, oh, I have a question for you. So your organization seems to be doing, um, seems to have done a lot for low income individuals. How can BNI, in collaboration with its signatory partners of Corporate Canada, build a supportive ecosystem for Black-owned businesses in Canada? And what impediments do you see going forward that must be overcome within and outside the Black communities to ensure sustainability of such supportive ecosystem? Yeah, I've got a short answer and a long answer. Okay. (laughs) I'll I'll start with the short answer. one of the interesting things that we saw in developing the Black Entrepreneurship Program is that um, the demographics of Black Canadians are changing. So um, my story is an interesting one. My, my mother is a Black Canadian from Nova Scotia. Uh, we've had immigration there since the 1700s. My dad is an immigrant from the Caribbean. I grew up in Toronto. And a lot of Eastern Canada, we see a lot of uh, Black immigrants from the Caribbean heavily and and increasingly from Africa. But the story in Western Canada is a lot of African immigrants and that population, those numbers are rising quite rapidly. Um, For immigrants coming here, you know, Black people aside, Many of them come from governments where the relationship isn't always friendly and it certainly isn't always trustworthy with government. And um, I think the number one impediment that I saw coming into this program is trust, really. A trust of government, a trust for transparency, and a trust to or a willingness to engage with government programs. Some of those are grants. Uh, We actually operate a loan program. It's a zero interest loan. Um, but that trust and willingness to engage in government processes uh, and entails a few different things. Um, I, I keep talking about visibility, but to put yourself on the map of, of governments, um, I had asked a question to Michaela earlier about sole proprietors. We're seeing a lot of sole proprietorships. We're also seeing a lot of uh, businesses that operate in the, or black owned businesses that operate in an informal economy. Not all of them are provincially or federally incorporated or registered. And so I think the way to overcome that, number one, is um, some of the ecosystem programs I'm working with is securing the trust to, number one, federally or provincially incorporate. This isn't a tax thing. The government isn't out to spy on you, but to access programs and to be investable, that's a base base requirement. We, we can't invest in companies that we don't know exist formally. Um, and then the impediment of, of just the trust of, it's not about monitoring, but it's really about affecting that change. And so the investments that have been made, we, you know, obviously ideally we wanna see successes, um, but black entrepreneurs need to approach those programs. And, and again, that visibility with, without engaging or 
willingness to have that conversation, it's really hard to move the dial on whether that was money well spent or not. So that's, those are, I said that was the short answer. <laughs> um, those, those are kind of the initial impediments that come to mind in terms of that visibility and willingness to incorporate. But then, then we can access some of those programs, we can access some of those grants, we can access some of those loans. And, and that is an important first step. Um, the, the planning and documentation, I've seen that with a number of companies is sometimes with the earlier stage businesses, um, I realize that there's a cost to uh, a level of auditing statements or having internal statements, whether they're internally prepared or audited externally or otherwise. But there's also a validation that comes with that and a level of maturity of that business and showing a willingness to play at a higher level. And, and again, all of this speaks to those businesses being investable. Yeah. Um, but that begins with planning and, and documentation. I realized that you know most of our companies that we're engaging with, many have business plans, but they're dynamic. The, the, the adage is that the, as soon as you write it down, it's out of date, right? And, and technology and other aspects are forcing us to move quickly. But that failure to plan is, is still a failure in, in itself. We, we need to know what a strategy is, what an approach is, even if it's a corner store, even if it's a sole proprietorship, even if you're selling food, like simple businesses or very complex or technology or otherwise. That planning and then also that documentation. Um, again, I want to emphasize that transparency isn't about tax purposes, but it's about recording where your business started and where it is today and where do you intend to be tomorrow mm -hmm. and and all of that structure and planning um again i think it de-risks what others see in the business and what the plan is and frankly the ability to bring on expertise that are outside of the ex outside of the organization bring them into the organization so investable businesses have a team because no one person knows it all no one person can manage it all but building out that team early and, and planning and documenting what that looks like, mm -hmm. that helps. And, and I think there's market signals to investors as to, to what am I putting my monies in and what are we paying for and where is this organization going? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And oh, we're running out of time, but I'm going to try and squeeze in a few more questions. So Charles, the next question is to you. And it's almost ties into what Oba was just saying now about um, impediments to black owned businesses. So he says, besides like lack of capital, what other things do you, do you see or have you experienced as impediments to black owned businesses and how can they overcome it? And for example, talked about like business, incorporating your business and documentation. So just wondering if you had some insights to provide here. Absolutely. Um, the very first thing that comes to mind is education. Uh, some people get carried away by the idea of owning a business um, and if you know, the forget to get educated educated on basic or first principles. Uh, I've had, um, I can tell you horror stories for the next three, four hours. Uh, I've had someone say, because they have 50% of the shares in a company, they can do anything. They can go to the register and remove their partner. They can go to the bank and freeze their account. Um, I've heard someone say that they have a partner, but there's no written partnership agreement, nothing in writing that, determines their relationship um, you know when you ask them for proof of the relationship they're providing you with whatsapp messages um, i've also seen um, people you know make mistakes they, they they're going to the bank to borrow money they don't understand what a personal guarantee is they have no idea that if they're not able to pay back if the company is not about to pay is not able to pay back the loan you'll be personally responsible so some of these basic um principles could be missing. And, and if you start off a business on the wrong uh, foundation, success is almost um, going to be fleeting. And how to overcome that would be to invest in professional guidance, invest in professional um, advice. You know, the $1,000 or $500 you would invest in talking to a business advisor or a lawyer will go a long way in saving you months, if not years of heart attack um, and costs thrown away out of litigation. So it's important to, if you're going to do something right, 
If you're going to do something, do it right. Start right. Um, build a solid foundation. Don't just go to the registry and pay for any dollars and register a company. You have to be more intentional than that. What are the articles of incorporation? Uh, what are the objectives of the corporation? If there's going to be a partnership, what governs the relationship? If one partner decides to back away from the relationship, how does that happen? Uh, would there be a valuation of the shares? Would there be um, a shotgun? How does the relationship come to an end? We get carried away so much about the birth of a relationship and not the death of it. Uh, so it's important that um, this basic information is um, people pay attention to them. Um, when I was taking over the firm, we do this for work, but we invested in external lawyer to help us put the deal uh, together because we do not want to be um, carried away by the emotion or our personal uh, investment in, in the relationship. So it's important to be educated. Um, sometimes I, lack of access to capital might not be the problem. The problem might be not having the basic information about what you're getting into. And then finally, having the right mindset. I think I've mentioned mindset three times already today. It's very important and that is very deliberate. Having the right mindset to entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is not the gateway to uh, being a millionaire. That's not how it works. Um, it's not nine to five. Um, it is living on urge, on edge every day, not knowing what tomorrow would bring, not knowing how you're going to meet payroll. Um, it's about walking into the office and knowing that you have a few people that depend on you uh, for their income every two weeks. And they also have people that depend on them. Um, so there's a burden that goes with it. There is um, a high level of responsibility that, that goes with it. Um, and, and once you also inject significance in what you're doing, um, as an entrepreneur, it's no longer just about you. It's about making a difference in somebody's, somebody's life. It's about keeping the lights open so that uh, your assistant could continue to train their child in school. Once you're able to inject significance into it and have a mindset of um, excellence, and uh, this is not a walk in the park. You know, some days may be rough. Um, once you have that mindset and you're educated about what you're going into, you have people that um, would catch you when you fall, if not prevent you from falling, um, then that is when success begins. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you. That's really helpful. I have a quick question for Michaela, and it has to do with um, the lines of credit. So what if you are offered a pre-approved line of credit and you don't really need it? Is it okay to to take a, to have it, like to have a lot of available credits if it's pre-approved? So for that, I did type a response. So I'll just reiterate what I said and then I wanna add something else to it too really quickly. Um, for a pre-approved offer, if, if your bank does that for a line of credit or a credit card, it's not a hard uh, inquiry on your bureau. So if you accept it, it's not gonna show up as, oh my gosh, this person went and applied for a line of credit. It won't show up like that because the bank is offering it to you. Um, so in that sense, they're very easy to, to, to get once you're offered them. And again, that goes to the point where it's being proactive if you do accept those, because typically when you need a line of credit, you're gonna have to do a full application and do give us all of the documents, we have to submit it, it has to go to credit and all of that. So it can take time for sure. So they're definitely a good thing to have. Um, if you're accepting it and just not using it and you have available credit on your bureau that you're just not using, that can actually be a good thing to your utilization. Um, I wrote out an example in, in the Q&A there. Um, like if, if you have a total credit limit um, up to $10,000 and let's say you hold a balance of $5,000 as a whole under all of your credit cards, that's a 50% utilization. That's a high number. Uh, when we're looking at that for an application versus if you accept a line of credit and that bumps up your total credit limits to 25,000 and you still only hold a $5,000 balance on your credit cards or credit facilities, that's a 20% utilization instead. So that brings that number down by having credit available. Um, the one thing I want to add though, in regards to just accepting all of the pre-approved offers and just having them sit there, that can also be a security thing too. 
if your identity ever got taken over for whatever reason, if your online banking got hacked, who knows whatever if something happened that's a lot of credit that can be accessed that you're just not using so there's there's it goes both ways in a sense um but but having low utilization can definitely help uh, when applying for a loan thank you so much just really helpful so accept the pre-approval when it's given can help so that because that helps if you do have existing loan like this helps bring down your utilization rate kind of thing right yeah. Okay. And I want to mention, sorry, I thought of something else. This is okay. just like a big tidbit, at least for BMO. If you're offered a pre-approved offer of some sort and say, hey, you don't want to take it right now, it's very likely that we'll offer it to you again, sometimes okay. twice a year. So it's not like a one and done type thing. It, it happens often if, if you get offered it once and you decline it. Okay. And just a quick question, because we're running out of time and I'm, I promised I'll stick to time. So we have to be done at six. So just a quick question. Is there anything you can do to get a pre-approval? Is there any way you can use your credits and stuff to actually get pre-approved or that's totally discretionary? I think it mostly has to do, and I don't know 100% the logistics of how they offer it to people, but a lot of it I think has to do with just your relationship with the bank. Um, if your accounts are in good standing, if if you've been with us for a while, and let's say you have a credit card with us and you're always paying it on time and you've never been late, then that history and that relationship builds with the bank that you're with. And then that's how those offers come up. Um, and, and also to that point, a lot of people who don't need credit get offered the pre-approved offers, um, but that just goes to being proactive as well. Um, just because you don't need it in that moment doesn't mean you might not need it down the road. Um, but I think the majority of it is just your relationship with the bank and the holdings that you have. Your bank account isn't going into excess um, that, unless you have uh, overdraft, of course. It's not going over that. Um, your existing cards that you have or loans that you have, you're always paying them on time. That definitely helps build the relationship to, to get those pre-approved offers. Okay, so... We have so many questions, but I think we'll try to collate these questions and try to answer them by email over the next few weeks and send them out to the participants here just because it would be impossible for us to go through all the questions. I'm so sorry about that, but I just want to give the panelists like maybe two minutes each and I'm going to be tough. Like I'm just going to mute you if you go over two minutes, but this is like a catch all question at the very end. Can you just tell us now that you have operated your businesses for a few years, knowing what you know now, if you were to start over on this business journey, what would you do differently? So, so maybe I start with Liz and Charles, and then we can get advice from Michaela and Ola. Uh, go first. Um, if I could... Sorry, the clock is ticking. Two minutes. Okay, sorry. That's out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I could go back 10 years ago, I, I would most certainly have bought an existing business. Um, we had enough money at the time to make a down payment on a, on a smaller business, like probably um, around like the 500,000 um, price point, which is, you know, an, an entryway. But in hindsight, like if we had bought that business, we would have been able to pay ourselves a living wage from day one. We would have been able to pay it down within five to seven years. And then we would have been able to uh, ideally you know in a perfect world you would have grown it during that time so we'd have grown the asset and if we had chosen to sell it at that point we would be in a much different position now than we were um you know coming through multiple multiple companies uh, uh this way and, and we haven't made a big yet i haven't had great exits but I've, I've definitely learned with every exit that i've had um so hopefully third you know third time's the charm but um, that, that's what have been my hindsight journey is like now I look at wealth creation much differently um, and I look at uh, business acquisition um, as a vehicle to that. Um, and a lot of our, our users are newcomers to Canada. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Charles. I should have been less afraid. I should have been more kind to myself. I was so scared of the future. I was so scared of the decision to take a leap, to take a jump. Um, a lot of doubts, a lot of, you know, uh, limited confidence. But knowing what I know now, some of the things that we fear the most doesn't exist. Um, so I should have been less afraid. Okay, so to Michaela and Oba, I just phrased that differently. Like, what would you advise to black um 
entrepreneurs or like business owners right now that will make their journey different, something like that. So all you can go. Yeah. Sure, I'll dive in. Um, I'm, I'm very big on the team. Build a strong and diverse team. Uh, the, the more that you build out that team, there's some strong signals. Uh, when I evaluate applications from companies and organizations, we look at management and governance. And, and those are big pieces of who we're giving money to and what the ROI would look like. Um, there's some discussion in the chat about supporting Black businesses amongst the Black community, and, and clearly that's necessary, but I'd argue that that's a first step. My, my piece of advice going in is that there is a bigger narrative here that Black businesses contribute to the betterment of Canada and, and here, and, and I think it's important that we control that narrative out there. So as important as it is just to be insular and look at supporting that business within the community, there's also a narrative that develops outside of the community. And it's important that we're in front of that narrative to say that we are all better when black businesses succeed and, and, and they contribute something to all of us to better our lives. And so I think there's outward signaling. There's some, there's some value that we live in the age of the influencer. And there's a narrative that needs to be put out there. And that can happen ecosystem-wise or with your business. Thank you. Michaela? Um, just to build on the management piece, because yes, we definitely look at management on who we're actually going to give money out to. Um, I would say the easiest applications I have submitting are the ones that have their business plan um, put forward and it's detailed and it has all the information there. And if it's a startup, it has projections and um, research was clearly done and all of that. Um, so I would say that finding those mentors, getting business consultants involved, um, not trying to jump into it alone and really investing in it yourself will will make a difference on, on when you're actually applying for loans and, and things like that. Thank you so much. This brings the Q&A to an end. I just want to say thank you to the panelists, but just a quick one. Here at BNI, we like feedback right away. And so we'll do like a word cloud. It's kind of like a game where if you can just type in the Q&A section one word about this um, that describes this event for you, it will be awesome. If you can just say one word, like we just want to know what we could have done better, what was great. If you can just type it into the Q&A box, that'll be really great. And while you're doing that, I just want to let you know about a few BNI events that are coming up that BNI is going to be hosting a career development and management um, program for Black professionals. We also have leadership and networking for success. Um, this program will be coming up in the near future, so just stay tuned. And then just to wrap us up, I'm going to hand over back to Dr. Chika, but again to the panelists, thank you so much. I learned a lot from this. I took away so many things like business acquisition, no need to start from scratch. Don't be too afraid. I like the whole, the innovation, the innovation ecosystem. I like the fact that you need to build your team. So thank you. This is great. Like you need to build your team and thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. So over to you, Dr. Chika. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chi. This was, this was wonderful. Thanks for, for hosting and moderating. This was great. And to all our panelists, thank you so much for doing a great job. Uh, we couldn't have done this without without you. So thank you so, so much um, to all the speakers. But most importantly, I think it's important to recognize that uh, Rome was not built in a day. It, a journey of a thousand miles starts with baby steps. And that's what we're doing at Black North. Uh, join, the, join, join Black North as much as you can contribute, be part of the uh, volunteers. And you can see on that list, there are lots of volunteers here in Alberta who are helping us to do this. And Katie, Chantel, Sherry, Bruce, Andre, Chi as well, Steve, Pastor Anayo Muka, Samuel, and Professor Gideon. And please join, uh, just send us an email if you can. We have Subis supporting us and we have other uh, people and companies who want to partner with us to support what we're doing. But I do want to thank, especially uh, BNI headquarters uh, team uh, from the ED executive director, the Harbor, as well as, uh, as well as the team over in Toronto there. I, Shelton, Khalid, and uh, Sagal. Please, thank you so much for helping us put this together. Um, this is an important event that we just had and uh, lots of questions that we're gonna to respond to. We do have your emails. If it's okay, we're gonna still send you 
some commentaries in terms of the questions that have been answered uh, electronically so that at least you have that. But please let this not be the stopping point for you. Take the leap. You heard Charles say that uh, fear was his factor initially. If you had to do it over again, he's going to go bold. I think you should go bold. There's nothing why you shouldn't. And if you make a mistake, we learn from it. And failure is not an option. So again, put your mind to it and let's do it. Most importantly, thank you so much for spending these two hours with us, uh, leaving all you're doing just to join. And hopefully you've got something out from here. We've tried to answer most of the questions, but uh, feel free to get in touch. Blacknot.ca. Just go there and uh, go to the inquiries and then um, just say that you want to reach out to BNI Alberta and uh, they will direct you to us. Once again, thank you. Have a good evening and all the best.